Uh, hi, Kawai, how are you? <laughs> Sorry. Um, Kawai is uh, born and raised uh, on the big island of uh, Hawaii. Um, and he lives in Min Minneapolis um, with his wife and two daughters. Um, and he's live with us today. Um, I'll, I'll also, I'll start out with some praise for his debut novel, because he wrote the fantastic novel Sharks in a Time of Saviors. Um, it's called A Searing Sibling Saga, a powerful debut novel that delicately blends Hawaiian myth with the broken American dream. Um, maybe a first question, because you're in Minneapolis. Um, how are you <laughs> with the presidential elections, of course? Yeah, the presidential elections are... It, it's an it, it's an interesting time in the United States. It, I suppose it is it is an election that is befitting of what the last four years have felt like, meaning uh, very very anxious and 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 frustrating and full of misinformation. Yeah, and that's you know in many ways is the state of our country. So yeah. I think for most most citizens of the United States right now, I think really it's a time to be patient and to trust that the state and county officials that are in charge of the elections in their mm. specific jurisdictions are doing the right thing and that if if the law requires anything of them that they will deliver on that and the rest of us just need to wait and let the process take its its proper yeah. course and when it's over we'll know how many votes have been counted and we'll see yeah. Because the the election is. Minnesota is well most people vote for Democrat right like in Minnesota, where you are? Yeah, it sort of varies. So you'll notice that what we're seeing more and more, the results of the election, specifically in Minnesota and, and down to the level of the, the sort of the state of Minnesota, you can see that there's a very, there's emerging in the United States a very strong indication that the parties are starting to split on what looks a lot like a rural and urban divide. So mm -hmm. people who live in the more rural, remote parts of a given state anywhere in the country are much more likely to vote Republican and the people that live within the urban areas, whether that's right in the middle of a city or if they live right on the edges of the city, they are voting, they are voting more and more democratic. Yeah. So we're starting to see what looks more and more like a, a very strong partisan divide between people who live in more rural parts of the, mm -hmm. the state and people who live in the more urban parts of the state. And that's something that's starting to play out more and more across the country. I think we're seeing that happen in more and more states. Yeah. Very interesting times. But we're not here to talk about that <laughs> today. Um, we're here to talk about your book, of course, uh, Sharks in the Time of Saviors. Um, let me try to summarize what, what's it about, what it is about. Because it's about three siblings from Hawaii, uh, each of them having to deal with the fact that the middle one, Noah, is sort of like the mythical chosen one, I would say. Um, because what happened was he was... Um, saved by a shark when he fell into the water when he was seven and that's why his parents, typical Hawaiian parents I would say, um, believed that he was somehow blessed or, well the book is about whether he's either blessed or cursed I would say. Do you, would you agree? Yes, yeah I would. <laughs> it really becomes a question of you know to what degree the things that they are experiencing and they're, they're seeing happen are whether their interpretations are the correct ones and everybody has their own interpretation. And so at the same time as they're interpreting what they're seeing, the question also becomes, well, what does that mean for not only for Nainoa, but for the other siblings in the family? And if he really is something special, then what does everybody else, what other role do they have to play in that story? And if he isn't the, the somebody that's like the chosen one, then, then what does that mean from all of them as well? Yeah, because he sort of manifests healing powers well during his childhood. And as I noticed there are a lot of uh, di different um, Hawaiian methodological elements. Um, I was wondering how... Uh, did you grow up with these myths and all these tales of gods and night marches you mentioned in the book? Yeah, yes, very much so. I think that... One of the things that's interesting or one of the things that I've really appreciated and enjoyed about growing up in the islands was the mix of 
folk tales and, and legends that come from a variety of, of cultural origins and all the ones that you've listed there and all the ones that are in the book for the most part are ones that come from native Hawaiian mythology, but there are many other myths and, and superstitions and, and things that come from a variety of cultures that mix in as well. And all of those were part of my upbringing and they're part of what makes among all of the states in the United States, it makes Hawaii one of the, I would say one of the most unique states. Yeah. Um, I read somewhere that um, the image of the shark saving a child kept popping up in your head for maybe ten, over 10 years or something. Uh, could you talk us through the, the whole process of reworking this kind of image into a whole book? Yeah, so, so the book took me 10, it took me 10 years to write the novel. And I think that the, the image of the shark showed up in my head, I think maybe two years before I started actually writing anything about it. I don't know where the, I don't know where the image came from. Uh, all I know is that it kept coming back and it would come back at the most unexpected times. So I would be, you know, washing the dishes and it would show up or I would be maybe driving home from work and it would, it would show up in my head. And after that happened a few times, I started asking, well, what is this image? What does this mean? If this, you know, if this were a story, what would the story be about? And I think because it, it wouldn't go away. And I started asking questions Then I started engaging with it. <laughs> and then it became something, it was like, well, is this something that I should be writing about? What is this? And I decided that it seemed like something that was interesting enough to see if it would work as a story. And then there was the question of whether it was worthy of being a novel or is it just some sort of short story? And it expanded from there because I started to ask questions about a, a family. For whatever reason, I think that when I was the image of a child, in a situation of distress, at least for me, it often makes me wonder about the family, the larger family around that child. And so with this image and the idea of, of a child being, being rescued from drowning by sharks, the next question for me was, well, who is this child's family? And so that brought up the questions of who the family was. And I started to play with those and see what that built out as far as whether it would be a story or a novel. And the more time I spent with each of the, the family members trying to understand who they were and what this event meant to them, the more it felt like something that was rich enough to build a novel around. And, and that was when I started sort of looking at it as a, a novel sized project. Okay. But talk us through these 10 years that took you to write this novel because what, um, cause you created this whole um, dynamic between three siblings and each of them are so different. I was so, uh, it's so admirable to read how different these three are, even in speech and in, the way the older brother Dean uses pigeon, for example, or uh, the the sisters, like the one who uses the word like a lot. Uh, um, how did you keep notes of like each three siblings, how the speech patterns or how did you do it? Yeah, so that was probably the first, I think around the first year or so of work was really understanding each of the characters, each of the main characters, the siblings and the mother, and starting to get a sense for who they were in the family and what they thought of themselves and what they thought of the other siblings and their parents and what the implications for those things were in terms of how they interacted with the rest of the world. And so you see in the case of, for instance, Dean, I, he was a character that I started to build out that I, I wanted to explore the idea of the kind of resentment that would build between siblings and the kind of rivalry that would exist and what that would mean in terms of who Dean would become if he's, if he's seen not as like the chosen one within this family's myth of itself. And that breeds a lot of resentment. Well, what does that mean about who he's going to become? And I thought it was also worth sort of looking at him as a very sharp contrast with Nainoa in terms of his intellectual engagement with the world because he's, he's much more of a physical character. He has a much, he has a very simplified view of the world. And so I built out his language as somebody who doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about things in really complex intellectual terms and doesn't have a much more sort of poetic or, or lyrical interaction with the world. And so his, his, his speech patterns came out as a result of that and, and both that and yeah him kind of rejecting his role with his his but mother and and so Cowie was the same right it was a question of yeah. like okay well she's in a different sort of situation um but she's maybe somebody that approaches things 
intellectually equal to the way that that Nainoa does, but is still in this rivalry situation, then what does she seem like? And so it was kind of going back and forth between both understanding who they were as characters independent of each other and understanding the dynamics between the characters and the implications of all those things in terms of how they interact with the world. Yeah. So uh, are they based it's a huge on, challenge. Are they based on people you know? I mean, especially with the speech, they're not. <laughs> no, no, they're not. You know, I'm, I really made a conscious effort. I, I don't think my life is very interesting. I wouldn't want to read a book about my life. I don't think anybody else does. And so the characters are created completely from the ground up, which is part of the reason it took so long. Uh, but I did also want to include, in terms of just the language itself, I really wanted to include pidgin and yeah. the sort of Hawaiian patois because it's, it is to me such an important part of, of the culture of the islands. It's a very, it is a very unique way of speaking. And I think it has its own creativity and fluidity and, and rhythm. And those things are all a part of being in the islands. And so I wanted people to feel when they're reading the, these characters, I want them to feel transported into, into the reality of the islands. And part of that is, is pigeon. Yeah. Uh, so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make the rhythm of the language work on the page, but also to do it in a way that made it, it possible to read it and feel the rhythm without getting too confused by all of the apostrophes and, and sort of the written marks you could use to kind of show the language. So, What was the hardest part of this whole process of distinguished voices in this novel? Uh, keeping them uh, keeping them distinct from each other and true to the characters. So considering who each character is and having to craft a unique language that expresses that that character, especially since they all had different levels of of approaching the world that that implied a different type of language. <laughs> so it was, it was very challenging. It's very difficult. Uh, and I think that also trying to do those things and keep them, I did a little bit of work to try and make their language change over time. So early on, I tried to make their language more indicative of being young in the islands. So they're younger children at the start, but in the later stages of the book, it's, it spans about 20 years. And so by the later stages of the book, they're much older and they've spent more time away from the islands. And so their, their language has changed as a result of living in different places. So having the language change and, and sort of mature over the course of the book, along with their, the level of their patois changing over the course of the book. Wow. Yeah. Is and that, keeping that true to each specific character. It was like a huge challenge. It was very yeah. challenging. I don't want to be the one to say this, but uh, is it also based on how you, your own speech pattern has changed? Because you've moved to Portland when you were 18, right? So yeah. Is it based on that? Can I say it, that? To some extent it is, both like observing that in myself, but also observing it in friends and people that I had known from the islands that had left and come back or had, you know, started living in a smaller town and then lived in more urban areas and had gotten older and the way that your language changes over time as you acquire more knowledge. It was it was definitely observing both myself and and other people I knew from the islands that had lived in other places and had their mm -hmm. language change as a result. Yeah, talk about like Hawaiian identity. Um, I myself always struggle with the idea that I've also written a book about um, uh, identity, so Chinese identity in the Netherlands. And I was wondering how you as a Hawaiian American see that. Did you ever struggle with, I don't want to be seen as the one that wrote a book about Hawaii or, or not? Yeah, yeah. I think that it's something that is... So I think it's important to mention that like my, I have a very interesting and complex identity that has been informed by a lot of different experiences in my life. So I, I grew up in the, in the islands. I was born and raised there. Um, I, I have a Hawaiian name, but my parents came to the islands from other places. So my mother is black. She's an African-American and she and my father, my father's European American. He's white. We use the term white in the United States mm -hmm. for something like that. Um, they met, in Hawaii and I was born and raised there, but my identity extends back into those other places that are sort of external to the islands. And so my identity is this combination of being very specific to the islands, but also being informed by the history of my father and mother's uh, lives outside of the, the, the islands. <clears throat> and so in writing this book, I, those things were all considerations, but because there are so few novels that have 
that have been written from the perspective of the islands, mm -hmm. there it has been a challenge to not have the novel be... There's this reductive expectation that because most people have not encountered very many books from Hawaii, that at some level this book is going to be should be held up as an example of, of speaking for the entire island or mm -hmm. things like that. And it's just not possible. It's no more possible for me to speak for, for the entire population of the Hawaiian islands. than it is for any one person to speak for any larger group of which they are a member, but are just a unique individual within that larger spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so when people, I think when people try to ascribe a single individual, this sort of broader mouthpiece for a larger group, it's because at some level, they're, they're simplifying that group and thinking that there is one specific narrative or one specific story that will somehow like explain that entire group. And that's not true of any group, whether it's a gender or you know, a sexual identity or a, an age, right? So people who are, are any of those different groups are going to have entirely different experiences from each other and yet still be members of that group. And so it has been a struggle. There have been a lot of events and things that I have been at and even reading the reviews and, and people's reactions to the books. In a lot of cases, people try to try to box the book in and present me as if I'm some larger, larger expression of a bigger identity than I can be. Yeah. So, but that has been a challenge. Yeah. But, um, but it, I can also see the book as, well, you say it's being used as a way to... Uh, anti-stereotype Hawaii, I would say. Would you also agree? Because like, um, you also try to tell that there's more about uh, the Hawaiian islands than you, we usually know. Because, I mean, my image before I re uh, read this book is that, well, Elvis Presley in uh, Blue Hawaii or the singer of the Pussycat Dolls is from Hawaii. That's all I know about Hawaii. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. How do you see the, your book as uh, being a part of that? discourse yeah that's one of the reasons that i wrote the book you know a lot of the writing that i did earlier on when i was just being published in sort of smaller art magazines in the united states and you know there's maybe one or two thousand people that that read this magazine and i get published in it most of that fiction is not based in the islands and I think the more time I spent away from the islands and, and the more that I realized what an important part of my identity was, how central it was to how I experienced both the United States and the world as a whole, the more I started to be troubled by the way I saw the the islands being rendered, both in the United States and abroad. You know, I would oh. travel to different places and people would ask, oh, you're from Hawaii. You know, um, this, the only thing I know about Hawaii is blue Hawaii or this thing or that thing. And so I wanted to sit down and write something that I felt presented the islands in a different way than I think that most people had seen. Yeah, because how important is it still for you to, even though you've been away from the islands? Um, well, I'm just referring to your daughters because you're raising them. Are you raising them as like, you, you guys are from Hawaiian descent or you're just super American? How do you see that? I, I want them, I, I'm, I hope that there is some part of the culture of the islands that they experience enough that it becomes a part of their identity. It's a, it is a challenge because the rest of the United States are so different than, than Hawaii and Minnesota is very different than, than Hawaii. And so I, I think that trying to take stories and songs and things like, you know, hula from the islands and, and to keep exposing them to those things is one part of it we're hoping we'll be able to travel to the islands and spend some time there and see my family that's there when obviously when the coronavirus has been brought to a place where it's safe for us to travel we're hoping to visit there we've already done that before and i hope that we have the chance to do that periodically enough mm. that there my children can have memories that are rooted in the islands such that they kind of kind of extract some value from those memories in a way that helps them build an identity that that yeah. keeps the island as part of that as well yeah, um, I would also say that there's a sort of like a strong hint of um, the influence of like the mainland of well, America on the islands since the 19th century. Um, was that a, was is that how people feel in Hawaii nowadays, or did you? Uh, well, no, I wouldn't say it's exaggerate, but did did you put it on, lay it on thick, or how? 
Do I? How did? Uh, you? No, I, I don't think so. You know, I, I, I tried to present. I tried to present the islands, and the United States, the Greater United States, both in contrast to each other, but also as a clear like interaction, right? Like there's friction between the two, between the influence of the United States on what life is like in Hawaii. And some of that is good and some of it is bad, but then there are also ways that they're completely different and, and there is no overlap. And so I tried to find ways to, to show the parts of the islands that are very specific to the islands and very rooted in the islands themselves, as well as the parts that are American and, and sort of the interaction between those two. And I think that for anybody that lives in the, in the islands, I think that you experience those things on a daily basis because you see things that are not from the islands all around you, but then you also see things that are purely, you experience things that are just from the islands. And both of those experiences happen on a daily basis. Okay, yeah. Um, the mel the mother in the book Malia, um, she also she always talks about coming home. Um, there's always the pool of the islands uh, in each of the siblings, um, and I would also say that the book is also about ex escaping your legacy. Like um, you don't want to uh, stay in the narrative that's always been told about you and where you're from and what else. So is it is it possible to read the book that way like it's like an escape from uh, i would say becoming differently from your parents turning out differently from your parents for example or from yeah 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 absolutely i think that it, the one of the things that the novel looks at is is the idea of sort of the conflict between your your heritage and what that means in terms of the narrative that your parents or your ancestors have for you and your own personal narrative and what you think you are and what you want to become. And if those two things are in conflict with each other, you know, what does that mean? What does that, what does that mean about life or how does your life feel when those two things are in conflict? And when those things are happening at the same time as these other things that we're discussing where like the place that you're from and the place in which you're living are also in conflict. So having all of those things at the same time inform what you think your idea of yourself is. And so those things are all what the book is asking, but it is also asking the bigger question of this idea of, of a savior or the idea of the, like the chosen one. And whether that's something that is even really true, does it ever exist? Is there ever a single individual that can make such significant changes that we, we should be depending on a specific individual? Or is the reality much more complex than that? And most people are kind of tied up in, in doing things in the world in a way that you cannot separate one person's influence from another's and say that, that one person is a chosen one. So yeah. it's all of those things at once. <laughs> Yeah, I also do recognize when reading this book as a child of migrants that um, you either sometimes you hate where you're from and sometimes you, you're super proud of how, how your parents are. And I can really feel that in this book as well. There were a must, yeah, must have yeah been absolutely. Different. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, I also have, well, I read somewhere that you're a climate change advocate, climate policy advocate. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I spend a lot of time doing work, uh, volunteer work with a national organization, uh, several national organizations here in the United States. And the work that we do is at both a state and, and national level. And it's work that has been ongoing for, for quite some time. And it, it really what, what I'm trying to do or what I'm trying to accomplish with these organizations is to implement a national climate policy that, you know, that moves the United States in the right direction, that, that not only recognizes the scientific fact of climate change, but after recognizing that fact asks, well, what can we do in the United States? What is politically viable in the United States to start making the changes we need to make? And those have to happen at a national level economy wide. And so right now we're focusing on, on a climate policy that prices prices carbon emissions correctly so recognizes the the effect that carbon has the actual cost uh -huh. of of burning you know emitting co2 and then takes that thing and 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 um 
correctly ascribes that cost among the people that use it in a way that allows people who are in a position in which they have no choice but to burn carbon, they don't they don't feel the effects the same way that people who have a choice can. And so it should affect businesses and individuals differently and things like that. Um, yeah. And it's a, it's a carbon pricing plan that we're trying to pass that would work in the United States in a way that would agree with the different political views we have here. It makes it much more difficult to have as comprehensive a climate policy that you might have in countries where um, people's idea of how the government should be involved in their daily life is much different than it is here in the United States. But here people yeah. have very strong opinions about that. So it makes passing, passing national policy very difficult. Yeah. How has, how has this part of your life influenced the way you write? I, has it? I, I think it does. Absolutely. I think that the, the ways that it influences my life is obviously I wouldn't be doing the work that I do in climate if I didn't believe in in a shared in a shared existence between both the people that have come before me and the people that are going to come after me and the idea that the decisions and the things that need that are happening now in the world should be happening in a way in which we are passing the world on to the people who are coming next and we're not using the world up we're not we're not supposing that our moment in time is the only moment in time that matters and along with that I have like a deep love and respect and reverence for the natural world. And so to me, that means we have to be looking now at how we live in a way that we are pass on the legacy of the incredible natural beauty that we have to all of the generations that are coming next. Is it, in this book, you know, this book talks about that as well, right? Yeah. That's one of the things that the book thinks about. How, would, how do we see this influence in your book? Yeah, and you can see in the, in the latter stages of the book without giving too much away, mm they start to understand that the things that they're experiencing in the world extend beyond some simple chosen one idea. And they actually extend to a voice of the land that's asking more of them and asking different things of them than what they initially interpret. And so what they think is, is happening at the start of the novel and what they think this miracle is that they see happen with Nainoa it turns out that there's actually a much bigger story about the relationship between people and their past, between people and sort of the indigenous beliefs and lifestyles that existed before, you know, sort of the intervention of Western powers and what that means about what their future should be and how they should be, the relationship they need to rebuild with the, the natural world. Yeah. I also, I don't want to read this book in a very Eurocentric way, <laughs> sorry. But um, I noticed that it's a very, I would say, non-typical hero's journey. Do you know what I mean? Like a monomyth. Because um, I, I do see a lot of, like, the, the phases of this hero's journey, I would say, for Noah, at least. Um, for example, the refusal of the call, the reception of the vision, um, the meetings with the supernatural, of course, um, the roads of trials, I would say. Um, did you ever, did you keep that in mind while writing it or maybe not at all? No, I did. I did because I, I wanted the book to be, I think as I started writing it, you know, we're talking about going back to that initial image mm. and I have this image of a child being saved from drowning and I'm asking what that means and what the family's reaction to it is. And as I was working through like sort of the first draft, I realized that the, the novel was starting to feel very much like just a standard hero's journey. Yeah. And that, that doesn't interest me. And I, yeah. I think it doesn't interest me because I, I don't think it is... I, this it's just not the way the world works. I think that there's there's a lot of there's a lot of danger in perpetuating the hero's journey as a myth because the things that we need to do now in the world require us to think beyond individualism. And the hero's journey is very much one that emphasizes individualism. And I think that we we need to be thinking much more about the collective and the idea of our existence, an individual's existence being intrinsically linked not only to all the people that exist now, but all the people that came before you and all the people that are going to come after you. Yeah. And so as I was writing this and considering that as what I wanted the story to be about, then it changed the idea of it completely because it couldn't be a, a hero's journey if that was the case. And so I, I began to very consciously subvert the standard hero's journey yeah it worked really well because i really thought it was going to be ah oh, this is going to be a classic um uh, like descent of heroes into i don't know uh, but then yeah i'm not going to spoil it but i was really surprised that it's <laughs> not going it didn't went that way 
Um, we have one question from the audience because there is an audience and they are uh, listening to us and they are also sending their questions. Uh, one question from Melanie is, um, Kawai, how did you learn new things about yourself, about nature and climate change when you researched for this book? One of the, one of the things that I, I suspected, but I wanted to spend time understanding you know, as, as much as I could, was to what extent have the living practices of more ancient cultures were they were they more sustainable than what we have now, right? Or have we always sort of been in a struggle to use up resources too quickly and things like that? And I got to see all of these really excellent examples of indigenous practices, both in the continental United States and in Hawaii, that showed that out of necessity, you know, when people were living much closer to the land and they required a very intimate relationship with the land in order to survive, they had practices that were much more in line with, with maintaining that, that natural that natural world in a way that put them in a much more symbiotic state as opposed to just sort of an extractive state. And so it was really, it was really nice to learn those things and to deepen my understanding of how things were previously and to see that there are things we can implement now that we can learn from those and bring back into our practices to kind of build a better future. So that was certainly something that was uh, very nice. But something else that happened is I had two children, right? So now I'm, I'm, a, fa I'm a father with two children. Yeah. And when I started working on this novel, I, I did not have children. And so the experiences I have now as a parent and had as a parent over the course of doing the revisions informed my thoughts about the, the connection between parents and their children and between not only those children, everybody, everybody that came before those children. So I, you know, having experienced the birth of my first daughter, I had this very incredible, this, this sudden, f I could feel the connection between myself and everybody that came before me wow. flowing through me to my daughter in this really, really powerful way. And so I suddenly understood myself as being part of a much bigger picture than just myself or just myself and my parents, but mm -hmm. myself, my parents, everybody that came before my parents and everybody that was associated with them in the islands and how all those things linked together to these issues of sort of, you know, the, the past and the way people were living in the past. Yeah, you can see that really well in the whole story that you're telling in this book, right? The whole idea of the people that come before you, all the, the your ancestors. There's a word for it, right? The, what was it? Like a spirit, I wouldn't say spirit animal, but a spirit in the shape of an animal that's, what's the word for it? Uh, yeah, it's it's <laughs> Almakua. Yeah. In, in the native Hawaiian language, it's called Almakua. And that's the sense of an animal. And this is a belief that the, the native Hawaiians have. And it's something that still exists today in, in the islands as a belief is that your your ancestors can kind of visit you through animals and that often you'll find you'll have experiences with certain animals or certain parts of the natural world that are indicative of a specific part of your like ancestry coming back through a specific type of animal so what that would mean is like some families amakua might be a shark and another family's amakua might be an owl or something like that. And so you start to have a certain part of the natural world that seems to be more strongly associated with um, ancestors. And they can come back and a lot of people will, will talk about it as like a guardian spirit or things like that, or some yeah. sort of guidance, right? And so your ancestors are reaching out to help you in the present through these animals that they're kind of reliving through. Yeah. Um, how did writing this book change you as a writer? Not, well, not as a person, but as a writer. Uh, so it really, I, I really became much more <laughs> mature as a writer. And <laughs> so I learned a lot about writing just in general. I learned how to let go of, of parts of writing and not be scared to fail, but also to reject, like when I fail or when there's a whole section, whether it's like 200 pages or 20 pages or one sentence yeah. to be willing to say like, that doesn't work. So it leaves, it goes out of this book. It goes out of this page. And I think that there's a tendency when you're first writing to be scared of that, to be scared that when you write something and then it's it's a failure to, to, if you get rid of it, instead of continuing to try and improve it, that you might lose something if you don't do that. And I got to a point where I'm much more comfortable now with taking, you know, 50, 100 pages and just being like, these don't work, so they're wow. going away. And 
um, I didn't, it took a long time for me to, to be comfortable with that, but it was necessary because when I was in the early stages, there's like all of these pages and there's so many things happening. And I was like, this can't all be in here. And so I had to say, well, okay, well, this part isn't working. So it has to go. Oh, wow. Um, it, I'm also starting to write, in, write a novel next year. So that's, that's your main jest that you got from debuting your first novel. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Just I just got much out. more comfortable with, with failing and just being like, I can throw this all out. You know, I can write, you know, I could start writing a novel and be like, this isn't the right novel. I could write 300 pages and be like, this, it doesn't work and just start over. It's time to start over. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do that. <laughs> that sounds scary to just throw away stuff, but yeah. Okay. Um, we've got another, another question from the audience and uh, from Nick. Um, he asked, he's asking, do you feel the way, do you feel that the way you wrote this book changed when you had your children? I think, I think that there are sections of the novel without giving too much away. There are parts of it in which I was writing from the perspective of parents, but a lot of that writing happened before I had children yeah. and revisiting those sections after I had children. And as I deepened my connection with my children, the revisions for those sections, I think, became much more effective because before I was having to imagine what it felt like to be a parent. But in the later stages of the revision, I, I was a parent. And so I could go back and look at those sections and, and deepen the truth, you know, the truth that was trying to be expressed artistically. And so I think that the sections that have to deal with parenting and the relationship between parents and children got much better after I was a a parent and could use that experience to inform them. Uh, but it also made some of those sections much more painful and scary because there's some parts of it that I had to write that were, they were uh, affecting me emotionally much more after I came back to them having children. Yeah. I'm trying to say this without giving anything away. So yeah. <laughs> it's kind of hard to answer directly. Gotcha. Um, but did you change any of the storylines after your children? I mean, um, I, most of the plot experience. was in place. Yeah, no, no. Most of the plot was in place and didn't change dramatically at that point. I think it just became, it became easier to, to enrich the relationships mm. between the characters in a way that felt much more truthful and to really ask, okay, well, would a parent say this to a child or how would a parent feel if their child did this thing or if their child says this to them or reacts this way to them? How are they going to feel internally? And, and those parts um, improved. But I didn't, I didn't change the book plot dramatically most of most of that was was done well before i think my children were were okay. in my life so yeah. it's hard to remember it's 10 years yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> so. 10 years wow um who do you hope reads this book i mean do you, mainland americans parents maybe children i don't know yeah you know you. It, as many as i obviously i would like as many people as possible to read it it's always nice just to have a broad set of perspectives. It's always interesting to hear from people that have read the book because they'll take such different things away from it depending on whether they're from the islands or not, whether they've ever been to the islands or not, whether or not they have children. You know, all of those things can have an impact on on people's um, reactions to it. And so, it's the more people that read it, the the more nice it is to to hear from readers. And, but it's also interesting. I think I've I've kind of let go of the book in the sense that, I th for me as a writer, I feel like all of the work that I do and all the hopes that I have for the the art, kind of have to stop once it has left my hands. Once I have done everything I think I can as an artist with the piece of art, mm. I have to be willing. I have to accept that. I can't control how people are going to react to it. And I, so I have to be open to every possible reaction. So some people might read it and hate it, right? Some people might read yeah. it and they're bored by the 20th page and they put it down. And I can't be, you know, sad or disappointed by that. I just have to recognize that every book is not going to be for every reader at every time in their life. Because even myself as a reader, there are books that I didn't like when I was 20 years old and I can read them now as a 40 year old and have a completely different reaction. And so I've, yeah. I've gone back to books that I didn't like before. And now I love yeah. those books. Or there are books I loved when I was 20 and now I go back to them and read them and I don't, they don't have the same effect. And so for, I think the thing that is exciting for me is when I, when I encounter people for who it seems like the book was the right book for them to read at that moment. And so they have a really meaningful experience with the book. I think that's, yeah. it's always nice when people write to me and they say, well, this book was, 
I, I really enjoyed this book and I really enjoyed this book because of this or that reason and yeah. it had a profound effect on my life, you know. How did um how did Hawaiian people read this book? Like what did what kind of feedback did you get from people from the islands? Yeah. Well, so it's it's varied, you know, to be perfectly honest. There's some people that have read it and loved it. And there are some people that are like, this is nothing like my life, which is fine because there's no way it could be, right? There are some yeah. people who their experience of the islands will be nothing like this. And I think there's some people that have been like, you know, this book is getting attention and people think that, that it's about the islands, but it is, I, it has, it's nothing like my experience of the islands. And therefore it is a false narrative, you know, whereas uh, that's an unfortunate I think reaction for people to have, and it it's always disheartening when people sort of accept the idea that because the book is getting a lot of attention, it has to be a perfect representation of everybody's experience of the islands. Uh, and I think that that's like a false premise to start with. So yeah. some people, you know, have that sort of a reaction, but then there are lots of people that have loved it because they've said this is the first time I felt like a book. I've read a book about the islands that I know is written as if it is about the islands from people that have lived in the islands and not people that are writing as, as sort of not having lived in the islands and having a fantasy about the islands or things like that. Uh, so there have been many readers that have said, it's nice to read a book that I feel like identifies Hawaii the way that I have lived the, in the islands. So, yeah. This is a lot of pressure, nice. a lot of pressure from <laughs> the little books that come from Hawaii. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have, I have one last question from the audience, from Rachel. Um, well, it's a very simple question, actually. Is your book available in Dutch? Or is it going to be? I don't think so. Right now, I do not believe there is a, a Dutch translation in the works, as far as, as, far as I'm aware. Uh, sometimes there can be a little bit of a, a disconnect between whether or not I know a specific translation is there and whether my publishing team knows whether there's a translation. But I don't think so. I, I know that there's one in in Swedish and Italian and French oh, wow. and German and Turkish. Uh, those are all the ones I can remember off the top of my head. Did I say Italian? I think I said Italian. Oh. <laughs> I think those are the majority of the ones I can think of right now, but I don't think that there's a, a Dutch translation yet. Okay. Um, well, I really hope... If anybody is interested. <laughs> yeah, maybe this is, <laughs> this is your call. Uh, um, That's right. Yeah, maybe one day in the future. Um, yeah. Uh, I would like to thank you for this conversation all the way from Minneapolis. Um, I think you should go back to watching the elections, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I have to work. I can't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it happens in the background and I have to, you know, I have to go back to work. But, I, you know, I'm certainly watching the elections, but they, they're moving slowly. Everybody is being very careful and following the law and counting the ballots legally. And so it's a slow process. And I think a lot of people are obviously emotional and impatient. So. I'm I'm trying my best to be patient. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you and good luck. And I hope to meet you one day in real life. The same. Yeah, yeah the same. I, w I wish I could have traveled to be there in person. It would have been nice. It would have been nice to meet you in person and to see... Um, to see the Netherlands. I've never, I've never been, so it would have been nice. <laughs> Very to welcome. Some other time. <laughs> okay. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>